attendees, welcome everybody. I'm so nice to see uh, these uh, names over here on the right. I don't see any faces, but that's okay. I can imagine what you look like. My name is Max Orr, Executive Director of Carolina Public Humanities, and it's my uh, distinct pleasure to invite you to this virtual Humanities Happy Hour. This is what we do uh, in lieu of having live programs in front of people. We do live programs in front of our computer screens. Um, I still haven't figured out how to make myself look uh, any less blue, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're having a good time. I want to thank uh, all of the supporters of Carolina Public Humanities, uh, including uh, Cotton Merca Group and Morgan Stanley. Uh, we want to thank the General Alumni Association, who's been a wonderful partner with us and is going to be partnering with us uh, for all of our uh, programming that we're doing online. So we want to thank them for helping us spread the word to all of the alums uh, throughout uh, North Carolina as well as throughout the country and the world. Hopefully we'll get uh, international audiences uh, for these happy hours. And of course, we want to thank Carolina Meadows, a retirement community in Chapel Hill for their uh, continued support and all of our participants and uh, donors and, and generous friends uh, who we miss uh, just seeing you. So thank you for being loyal supporters and joining us today and, uh, and for all of you who support us in, in, in any way. Um, we have had uh, some wonderful programs. Uh, we do want to announce that next week we have uh, another program coming up on Wednesday night uh, with our uh, lovely coworker Joanna uh, Sirk Smith. We'll be doing a second look at food and in particular looking at the restaurant industry, uh, another industry uh, greatly stressed obviously by uh, the events uh, that we have going on. I also want to announce that uh, next week's happy hour will be looking at the international races from around the world. Although working with time uh, is always an interesting thing in this virtual uh, environment. Um, and uh, finally, I want to announce that not this Thursday, not next Thursday, but the Thursday after we have a special uh, Think Fast Forum. Instead of doing our typical humanities happy hour, we're going to team up with the GAA again to do a Think Fast Forum uh, on April 30th on mental health and all sorts of other programs and projects coming up. So please go to our website, humanities.unc.edu. Follow us on Instagram and all that good stuff. But let's get right to it. Um, look, music is so dear to our hearts, and I think music is sustaining so many of us uh, during this period. Um, and it also is an incredibly uh, well, damaged industry in this particular moment. So I want to bring uh, together some wonderful people and a mystery guest who study music, make music, and think and live music, and just get a sense of what this new virtual world is like uh, through their eyes. So let's invite our first guest on, uh, and it is none other but the super talented Florence Dorr. Florence, where are you? Do we get to see your, your face? Sure. There, I, there's the, yeah, I see the name and there, the, hello, Florence, hello. so good to see you. Good to see the you. last time we were working together was like a little bit over a month and we were in a studio together and you were getting ready to go on tour and I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, we went on tour. Yeah, you got the, you got a few good concerts in and, uh, and uh, when I, so thank you. And how is that? How is the family holding up? And how are you holding up in Chapel Hill? And um, we're doing really well. Thanks for asking. Good. Now, is there are there joyous sounds going on in the house? Yeah, there's we've, we've been making a lot of music. That's what I'll be talking about tonight. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to hear some of it and, and hear what you've been up to. Uh, next up uh, is another dear friend. Oh, I should mention, by the way, Florence Dorr. Who is Florence Dorr? She is professor of English at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the very talented songwriter and performer who uh, is, has just put together a fantastic band, and we'll hear more about that. Uh, now from the uh, Department of Music, Mark Katz, professor of music. Come on up, Mark Katz. Where are you? Hello, Mark I hear Katz. Her. Great. Mark, uh, Mark is a professor of music, ethnomusicologist, been studying uh, all, all over the world, also the former director of Next Gen, the wonderful State Department program. Mark, I believe you had a talk coming up with us at, uh, at Flyleaf Books that we had to cancel. My apologies. We'll, we'll reschedule, right? We'll reschedule, yes. We, I promise you and, and the world we will. Um, and I should also, I'm, I'm remiss to mention that Mark is the uh, uh, former director of the uh, Institute for Arts and Humanities. And I was remiss in thanking the Institute for Arts and Humanities, who are also a partner. So you've reminded me to thank all of those who are making this possible. So Mark, we'll hear more about what you have to uh, say about music in this uh, strange world we're living in. But how are you holding up personally? I'm doing pretty well. I, I'm in good health and I have a job, so I can't complain. There you go. Exactly. And, and as we know, that those uh, certainly can't be taken for granted these days. 
Okay, well, let's bring our third guest on, and that is uh, also from the Department of Music, Jocelyn Neal, who we also canceled the program on, didn't we? We had all these people. Uh, Florence, you're the only one who got a chance with me in this semester, but uh, at any rate, uh, what a joy, right? Uh, Doing Jocelyn, well, how thank are you? you? Do we, and are, 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 is the home life is holding up. Uh, you have nowhere else to go. So how's it holding up there? Lots of homeschooling, lots of projects. And again, we're very fortunate. So yes. Oh, well, Jocelyn, we want to start with you and get a sense of uh, your perspective on, you know, what, what are we learning about music in this particular era? And uh, what are some stressors we should be paying attention to? And what are some solutions? Sure, thank you. Um, gosh, it's great to see all of you. And um, I have missed seeing Florence and Mark, both of whom I usually see <laughs> regularly on campus. So this is yeah. a real treat. Um, and I'm excited that uh, so many of you are joining us tonight from your homes um, and your other locations. Uh, this is a crazy time for musicians. And I think you're gonna hear a lot from my colleagues up here tonight um, about that. One of the perspectives I've really been watching is um, amateur music making. Uh, we hear a lot in the press about people for whom this is a livelihood, but I also know just from daily interactions, this is really affecting people who sing in their local church choir, um, people who teach piano lessons, people who just like to get together with their neighbors and have a little quartet work, um, jam sessions, jam circles. So I'm really uh, just as a scholar interested in what's happening on the amateur music front. And there have been a couple of um, discoveries, I guess, or rediscoveries that have struck me. You know, what's oh. funny, Jocelyn, about that is so many people I know um, are taking this time to learn music for the first time and, you know, at woodshedding and practicing and feeling like now's the time to up my game and whatnot. So I, I certainly get the sense I'm seeing a lot of videos. Sometimes I don't always listen to them on Facebook, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of ukulele instruction available right now. Um, yeah, so if you so, can get your hands on a ukulele, you know, go for it. So what do you want to share with us, Jocelyn? Um, I think it's the intersection of regular people talking about technology. Um, there was a, a big confrontation in people's own minds when they came to terms with the basic laws of physics that um, there is no technology that would allow Florence and me right now to sing a duet in real time. Um, and so there are ways when, which we can make it look like we're doing that, um, but we can't actually do it yet. And that discovery of the laws of physics uh, has been on a lot of people's minds. And the other one for me is the big leap in technological uh, competency. Um, a friend of mine who teaches piano lessons had never had to deal with anything from online banking where they could get paid for their lessons um, through you know, PayPal or Venmo or something, or the idea of Skyping or Zooming or Google Meeting for your, for your lessons. So there's been a huge learning curve and a lot of intersection where professional studio engineers are offering advice and information. Um, and there's just a, a whole different approach to what it means to be a musician when you have to be able to, to run the tech too. Yeah, um, and sure. I did bring, you asked us if we wanted to bring a little something to share. And I brought two very short clips that are, um, on the one hand about this kind of technology where we get to see into the music making process and the other is the amateur music making. Um, should I go ahead and show a couple yeah, of little, little bits here? So the first thing I'm gonna show you is um, a virtual choir. You've likely encountered dozens of professional level uh, recording versions of virtual choirs um, and some amateur ones. And this is one that was done by a regular uh, amateur choir. Most people are retirement age. Um, so they started out with, you know, questions like, how do I use my cell phone? And so the learning curve was the urge to sing together, but also the, these technological leaps. So I'm going to go ahead and click over and, and show you just a little bit of that. Recognize one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that was a little project with just a bunch of you know everybody from teenagers to retired people in the community that wanted to try something out of their comfort zone. And was everybody using the same technology, or were there different technologies to get the the sound? I mean, I, how does that? And and was the teaching curve steep for more for other people and less for other, you know, for some? 
Yeah, this was, again, because we're all stuck in our homes, basically, with limited access to, to getting stuff and to helping each other. It's sort of a, a, I think of it a little bit like duct tape and bailing wire. Um, whatever you've got, you made it work. So some people had high-end equipment and some people didn't. Uh, kind of like tonight, I know that some of the people on this call are on good gear and some of us are on, you know, whatever we had in the, in the box in the garage. Oh, this um, is fake. This isn't doing it. This is just for show. <laughs> Yeah, but it looks really good. You know, you've got the boom mic and everything. Um, and then a lot of other organizations are, are doing this question of how can we perform at this time? And this is a professional orchestra from France. Um, and what struck me about this one is there's humor in it. Uh, the tuba player never has a note to play, but he's in the video having so much fun with it. So if you'll indulge one more quick clip here. So not only is the tuba player just there for total comedy effect, um, but I think a lot of people in uh, the, the public are enjoying seeing everybody without the facade of the tuxedos and the professional lighting and, you know, getting to peer into each other's houses. And, um, the poor tuba player, though, you know, there's got to be a there's got to be a, a special tuba only online extravaganza <laughs> for that guy. I am sure we could find one. Um, <laughs> so I just really have been fascinated sections of amateur musicians, technology, um, and then how, frankly, some of the professional work out there right now looks very much the same, you know, as it does right here. We've all got our bookshelves behind us or our desk lights uh, You don't, you know, have, a you don't on, have a Carolina uh, Public Humanities banner in your house that just I, stands up in your living room now all the time? Not yet. Not yet. And in that video, the percussionist didn't have any percussion equipment. Uh, so he's banging on, you know, homemade stuff. Now, it sounds really good, but um, this idea of improvising with what you've got in your space as a musician well, is you really that, current. Jocelyn. It's fan you know, fantastic. And uh, Florence, are you finding your own experience in recording and collaborative uh, to be, um, well, I know we're going to ask you more about it, but just in general, are you getting as much joy as you saw the people having joyous times uh, in those videos? Yes. And, and also, there was a, uh, I'll talk about the learning curve in relation to what Jocelyn says. I'm Suddenly, I'm a drum tech. Yeah, for sure. Well, and and, and uh, I've been finding where is that hum coming from, or why do I sound like I'm in a tin box, even though I'm speaking through a microphone? I I wish I had paid more attention to all the wonderful people who did sound back in the day, and uh, just tell me, Max, turn down your guitar. And I wish I had paid more more attention to other things than that. Mark, let's turn to you. Hello, Mark. And uh, Hello. what are you? What are you thinking about when you think, I know you work a lot with electronic music, so I imagine there's a fair amount of this kind of uh, recording and production that might already be skills people that you work with already have, or, or how, what is the same and what has changed in the type of music that you're looking at? Well, I, I study uh, music technology and I study hip hop, and I've noticed a lot of online hip hop. Um, and um, I'll show you uh, just an image of an, a poster for an event that happened um, just a little while ago. And um, I don't know if you see this, it's, uh, this actually looks like an old fashioned uh, hip hop poster, exclusive, legend versus legend, DJ Premier versus the RZA. These are two hip hop producers, people who make beats, and they were in a beat battle. And uh, it was just on April 11th, and this was uh, hosted on Instagram. So, um, I mean, this is fascinating in so many ways, but one thing that I just find interesting is that it, it reminds me of, of when people were first starting to figure out how to use uh, the phonograph early in the 20th century, they would make concert programs for in-home record recitals. So there, there's a sense of, of history repeating that we're trying to learn how to use new technologies by invoking older ways of engaging with music. Did you get a chance, so this has already happened, did you get a chance to see this particular uh, event? 
or well, I um, I didn't watch it live, but it's been recorded, and so I I did get to watch some of it. It was basically these two uh, these two artists playing beats that they had already um, composed before and going head to head and voting and whether they think uh, Primo's beats are better than Riz's and. Uh, most people seem to think it's a draw, though. There's been a lot of uh, arguments. Everybody's just being nice because we're all in shock, you know. Someday the, someday the trash talk will come out, I'm sure. Well, it, it did, it did. But <laughs> I, think, uh, I think most people are just happy to be there yeah. and happy this is happening. You know, I'm, really, um, I'm interested, Mark, because you do have, you know, worked with electronic music uh, for, you know, for decades now and thinking about this transition to electronic music. And what Jocelyn said is really interesting. You know, I think a lot of people assume that there is a giant tube of connectivity that could make everybody do everything uh, spontaneously. And so are people catching up to what is possible with technology? Because, and again, you're working with people who are doing a lot of production already and are working with high tech already in terms of music. Uh, what is being revealed by this and, and will there be some technological changes that come out of uh, this experience? Well, I think there will be changes. I think um, one thing that Jocelyn, I think was alluding to is the latency issue, uh, meaning that um, the, the speed of sound uh, is not getting any faster and um, there, and the speed of light uh, is not getting any faster. So, um, there will, uh, there's almost always a little bit of a lag that you have to deal with. So it does matter if I'm trying to play with Florence or Jocelyn versus someone who's in Australia. So there are some things that we just can't, we can't fix um, at the moment, but people are getting better. But I will say there's a lot of really kind of uh, amateurism or amateurishness. Um, just even in this battle, it starts out can you hear me? Can you hear me? Are you muted? Take yourself off mute. Yeah. Um, so we're actually, I think we're tolerating a lot and sort of ignoring a lot of um, kind of bad production that we wouldn't put up with if we were live, but we're just so happy that we're, that we're able to connect through music. You know, that makes me a little nervous because I feel like we've already um, taken a lot of sacrifices by getting used to MP4s or, you know, like, or, you know, that squashed sound already, you know, and we don't have like FLAC lossless or these other uh, formats that can be really delivered uh, with this bandwidth. So, you know, it's a scare. I'm glad that people can appreciate music for music making at all, but I hope we don't get too used to bad sound quality because we already were in that conundrum. Well, we are, um, but the good news is that is that we can hear through that, and uh, what really matters is that connection. Yeah. And um, let me just uh, tell you very briefly about something that I didn't, even, I wasn't planning to talk about because it just happened in my class about an hour and a half ago. I invited a uh, beatboxer to uh, to my hip hop class, and um, and he, uh, it was a great experience because he um, he created a beat um, that he then looped. And then he started rapping over the beat and then asked students to write words in the chat box on Zoom that he then freestyled around. And then um, another student jumped in and started rapping and then another student started scatting. So um, it was, a, I mean, it sounded pretty bad, uh, not in terms of the, um, you know, the talent, but the sound and they couldn't hear each other that well, but the students just loved it. And one point I'll make too is that we took advantage of the medium by using the chat box and mm -hmm. using some of some of what Zoom can do. So that's just an interesting thing I've seen. People are figuring out ways to do things with the technology they have that they couldn't do live very easily. You know, I, one thing I was curious about, because I know with your work um, all over the world, I mentioned to, uh, I mean, introducing you, you were the director of Next Generation of the fantastic State Department program at Hip Hop Diplomacy. And of course, you just, uh, uh, your fantastic work that just came out. Uh, you help me with the name. Your latest book, oh, uh, build. build. I just yes. Uh, yes, thank you. I knew I had it. I uh, at any rate, uh, this fantastic work. And just tell us a little bit. Are you in touch with some people internationally, uh, and what they might be going musicians internationally, and what they might be experiencing? Yeah, I'm I'm regularly in touch with um, musicians all around the world that I've met through uh, through this program. And uh, there's a common uh, a kind of element of suffering. People are losing money. They many, many canceled gigs, tens of thousands of dollars or the equivalent in their currency of lost wages. Uh, but 
the thing that's been really um, heartening is how people are, are adjusting and finding ways to deal with it. Some are saying, well, this is my opportunity to um, dust off some old projects or to, um, to get really creative and hold up and do some writing or do some remastering or practice woodshedding. So um, even though people have, are really uh, taking a hit and it's going to hurt a lot of people and it's going to last, they are finding ways to stay creative and stay active. Oh, that's nice to know. I mean, I, I, uh, it's nice also that all of us have music in our own homes, but boy, it'll be nice to be able to get it out of our and into the public because there's something so incredibly communal about this. Florence, uh, tell us about what you've been up to. Uh, you have been able to make music in your home and you have a wonderfully musical family. So, uh, and, and as I mentioned in our introduction, you were just about to kick off on a, a whole spring of music making and whatnot. So how have you been coping and tell me what, uh, what, have, what you've been doing during this period? Sure, so um, I'm a professor of English. I teach a songwriting class uh, and I wrote a book about uh, the intersections between Southern fiction and rock and roll which came out in 2018 and um, the conversation. Novel Sounds. Novel Sounds. I remembered I, that book title. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I was looking to see, I have your book, Mark. I was looking to see if I could show it, but I, I can't, I don't know where it is right now. But anyway, um, so I'm trying to find this. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so, so through the conversations around novel sounds, I, I, I got to talk to like Richard Thompson and Steve Earle and all these different musicians. And so I got inspired and Griel Marcus and um, all, all these people who are really um, writing music and writing about music and interested in music. And I started to write songs again. And so, yes, I, uh, I've started to uh, put a band together and a, a record and, um, you know, I, I also feel quite fortunate. I have to say a lot of musicians are in the situation, including people in my band are, are in the situation uh, where they have no income now. And so, um, so there, there was a song that Peter Holzapple, another person in my band from the DBs suggested that we cover, that I cover. The song is called Somewhere Down the Line. It's a song by um, Marshall Crenshaw. And uh, when everything shut down, we had recorded one song for my record, but then we kind of had to cease. Um, I was like, God, that song took on a whole new meaning. Um, I'm going to play you a little bit of it because we uh, they then ended up deciding to try to record it remotely. Um, and so what we did was to, I'll show you my microphone. Oh, it's much and fancier than my microphone. Somebody gave it to me, loaned it to me. FJ, shout out to Good Look Studios. I bought this. It's an interface mm -hmm. for your garage band. It cost a hundred bucks. A lot of money for a musician, but um, again, we're fortunate to be employed at University of North Carolina. So we decided just to do it on garage band. The other people in the band have um, uh, better studios, but um, we just had garage band. I became a drum tech. Uh, I learned that many of your favorite recordings in rock and roll were the drums were recorded with one or two mics. So that's what we did. I was talking with Don Dixon on the telephone. He's the one who um, produced the song and saying, okay, I do, and it was just like, throw the mic in the bass drum. So it was like, okay. So, so we did this kind of makeshift recording and, um, and I'll play a little bit of how it came out. And I'll talk about the fundraising that we're trying to do um, in order to release it. Okay, so there's, here it is. Oh, and oh shoot, I'm gonna, I forgot to do the sound trick. I will do it now. This is, the, this is what you call adding the charm to it, Florence, with the going back. There we go. The online world, right? Exactly. Somewhere down the line
now I'll show you a little bit of um, what it looked like, uh, apropos of what um, Jocelyn was saying about, and Mark was saying about just getting into people's living rooms. This is me doing the acoustic guitar in my pajamas. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. So, you know, we all videotaped ourselves doing this. So that's all you're gonna get of that. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure we saw it though. Oh, really? Okay, we, we, we need to share your screen so we there. can see. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. This is what it really looks like, people. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's all. And uh, I'll, can you see that? That's my uh, web page. I want to just point it out to you because um, that's my band. That's Mark uh, Spencer from Sunbolt. That's Peter Holzapple from REM and the DBs, my husband on the drums, Will Rigby, and behind him is Jeremy Chatsky on the bass. When we were on tour, um, we got the announcement that uh, South by Southwest had canceled and Mark was like, how will I pay Mark? You know, like it's, that's, that musician, this is your income. It is a devastating time. So we decided to link up the release of this song with um, a relief fund, the Orange County, oh, and I was gonna show you that, but I can just tell you about it. Orange County, um, the Arts Commission uh, for Orange County has put together a fund, an artist support fund. And so I'm trying to, I am partnering with that fund, the, the woman, Katie Murray, who's wonderful, uh, released my song and we're hoping to involve other bands in, um, in, a, in a funding project. Right. Uh, I think the town of Chapel Hill is going to be involved, I hope. The Splinter Group mm -hmm. is going to be involved. And so every couple of weeks, we're going to release a song that's produced in this way remotely. Um, and the the proceeds will go towards not just artists, uh, definitely musical artists who are suffering, but also to, I hope, um, the Cat's Cradle, because mm -hmm. of course, um, we want to have some place to play. Yeah, I understand. All of these, it's a, it's the, the down market or whatever from not just the musicians, but the whole industry is affected yeah. by this. So, so I, I want to second the, the pain part, you know, uh, for people who are, that Mark is describing the suffering that's, that's happening is real and the anxiety. Um, and, and then at the same time, you know, uh, so many, amazing things like Jocelyn's um that's a that's just such an uplifting thing to see um and also it was just it's been so exciting to be working on this recording mm -hmm. um it's taken away some of the anxiety um to be doing music to be woodshedding and doing all the other things that people are doing and um so once we get this up and running I, I'm kind of like thinking we could record the whole record in captivity. You know? um, <laughs> it sounds it sounds great. And those were all the, those were uh, two guitars or three guitars, bass and drums in that recording. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. It sounds. Well, and actually, I should say we also got Libby Roddenbaugh, who's a, a UNC uh, alum. Did she major in music? Do you guys know her? She's in Mipso, the great, wonderful band Mipso, um, and she. She, she and I were chatting. She was helping me out because she's young and she knows what to do with music these days. So she's been advising me. She's now my teacher. And anyway, it ended up that she played on the on the recording and, and she really made it. She's a wonderful musician. That's so. fantastic. Well, it sounds it sounds great. I invite uh, Jocelyn, Neil and Mark to ask each other and, and Florence and, and any of you want to ask each other questions. Let me say one last thing about this fundraiser. If yes. you would sign up for my mailing list on my florencedormusic.com because I'll send out information about uh the the fundraiser as we pull it together great thank you for thank that you florence all. and we'll be happy to uh, uh put that when we uh, by the way these are all going on our carolina public humanities youtube site uh, and so we ask you uh, uh, feel free to share those with anyone um you'll notice that paul has put uh, florence door music in the chat box there uh, I also want to remind anybody who's watching us, we have a chat feature down at the very bottom and a question and answer feature. Uh, we uh, encourage you to go to the question and answer feature and ask a question to any of our panelists at all, or if you have a comment or something you'd like to contribute, uh, please do so. Um, so I want to thank uh, Florence and Jocelyn uh, and Mark for these preliminary conversations. Um, and let's bring in our mystery guest now.
Uh, this is where the big reveal happens, and our mystery guest is none other than dun da 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 da. Here he comes. The suspense is killing me, and I guess I'm asking him to start his video. It is happy hour, so you never. Hey, hello, mystery guest is none. Oh yes, you did. You were doing a good job, and that happy is a, hour. That's a strong pour. I'm happy to see it. <laughs> uh, the um, Miss Mystery Guest. Yes, I'm going to change your name here. Your mystery guest is actually none other than Tom Baggett, executive director uh, for the national organization uh, uh, that funds uh, musical program Spread Music Now. Tom, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here with this illustrious and erudite group of scholars. Um, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I should mention, by the way, I should mention a, a full disclosure. I've known Tom for over thirty-six or thirty-seven years. Uh, so uh, if I get uh, if I get a little rude to Tom, it's just the way we work. No, Tom, I'm going to treat you kindly. Tom, I want to ask you just to give a sense of where was the music industry really even before this pandemic hit. Well, um, I'm afraid I'm going to be the downer here. Um, because I mean, there's there is some incredibly uplifting and just inspiring stuff happening out there in people's living rooms um, and their basements. Um, but I'm going to focus. I'm going to dig in a little bit on something that Florence mentioned. You know, how am I going to pay the band in context of South by Southwest canceling? I'm going to focus on the touring business and the professionals who are 100% dependent on making live music to pay their bills. That's where my expertise lies. Um, so just for the, for the audience who doesn't follow the music business every day, um, since roughly 2000, 2000 techno, like Napster disrupted things to the extent that it did, um, the importance of tour revenues, what I call the tickets and t-shirts business, surged to the point where touring accounts for 75% of professional artists' revenues today. Of course, that is now 75% of zero. Um, there is no touring industry. Um, and even though the mayor of LA said yesterday that he doesn't expect you know, entertainment, live entertainment or concerts or sporting events to return to 2021, I think this is possibly a little naive. Um, and it, it's gonna be a much longer slog than that because of how complicated the music industry is. Um, when you cancel, two or three seasons of gigs and you try to stuff all of that into a rebooking in one season, which you recognize at the time, you know, like my dentist appointment is going to get canceled again and pushed further down the calendar. It really complicates things. So I don't think that the business is going to return to where it was a month ago until six to 12 months after we have a vaccine, because it's going to take that long for the population to become inoculated. And so you've got a whole lot of variables in, in play here in terms of where the business was a month ago and where it's going to be then. Um, so I don't know, that's, uh, that's the downer side of things. Um, as we, you got to remember, one day, basically March 10th for the most part, all of the agents woke up and had to cancel hundreds of shows and rebook them. And uh, it goes well beyond the artists. It, 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 the music industry is a very, well, I, I'm going to call it the touring industry because that's what I'm focusing on here. You know, there is a lot of good stuff, a lot of potential for people who are, you know, who work in recording studios. Uh, Mark working in hip hop, you know, I used to manage artists who, sent tracks back and forth across the country as a part of their normal production anyway. And that is continuing and there's plenty of opportunity for people to get creative while they have nothing else to do. But the impact on the artists who and all of the crews, the club staff, the production people, the publicists, the managers, the agents, the cleaning staff, the the, the liquor distributors, all of this, the impact on this is really nothing short of devastating. There are no words. There just are no words. These are people who've had their entire livelihoods 
yanked out from under them. And, and it's not quite like they're, you know, professional athletes and they only have so many years that their knees are going to hold out. But if we're talking about a significant disruption of, you know, potentially up to two years before artists can really get back to touring and making money, we're going to see a lot of people drop off just like we're going to see, uh, according to a lot of, you know, research, up to 75% of independent restaurants, clubs, bars, not make it through the next couple of months. So th this is significant. Thank you, Tom. You've, you've uh, promised to be the downer and you have indeed been the downer. That's what alcohol is for, my friend. <laughs> So what, what, are, what are some music, I mean, uh, obviously there's no replacing that, but what are some of the ways that I've, we've seen some of the ways people are coping? Are there some things that your uh, organization is doing in helping uh, musicians cope or um, what, what stage, how does spread uh, music now shift in this climate that we're in? Well, like everybody else, we had to make some quick adjustments to reality. Let me give you a quick, quick timeline of where we were. I was hired a year ago yesterday. Um, I was headhunted, left a 25 year career in the music industry to run this nonprofit that I'm passionate about. Um, we own a trademark, Music Empowers. And frankly, that's what got me to sign up. I was like, holy crap, that's, that's powerful. Um, I spent the entire time from getting hired last year until March 5th working on rebranding the organization and launching our artist ambassador program that are, you know, our flagship artist is Ani DeFranco. Um, we, we launched the artist ambassadors with about uh, around eight or nine artists that range in size from, you know, they're mostly old clients and Ani isn't an old client, but her manager is a former partner. The following week as a part of the rollout was announcing Ani's tour with Indigo Girls that was going to be a plus one tour where a dollar from every concert ticket went to our coffers. 100% of the money we raise goes to fund programs. Um, I, I uh, was gonna be following up that tour announcement a week later with the next wave of artist ambassadors, which is another 20 artists, including um, Black Uhuru and some, you know, some great, good names. But you know, the day we launched, and I was aware of what was going on since early January. The day we launched was the day South by Southwest canceled. And I just watched the wheels flying off the wagon in real time. The following week, we did not announce the Ana DeFranco tour, obviously. Um, what we did was we pivoted to virtual life like everybody else. Um, on March 17th, my team and I launched um, what we call the Music Empowers Virtual Connections. It's an initiative to facilitate remote music construction and create a regularly updated clearinghouse of virtual music education resources to serve our students and to try to help out of work artists while in introducing those artists to our online community of about 220. And that's a, and that's a revenue stream, right? Uh, I think we're no. saying, no, it, not, not for the organization, but for musicians, hopefully it's a revenue stream. Potentially. You know, what, what's, in, what's inspiring about artists, I mean, there's so many things that are, but there, it's very hard to monetize the, the virtual space if you're a performing artist and you're doing a solo living room concert, especially if you're that poor tuba player. Um, you know, you really can't get your band to do a concert. Artists are going out into the virtual space in many cases, because they feel a responsibility to their fans. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the, someone who is a $25 ticket performer, you know, or, or the guitar player in a band that's a $25 ticket artist, normally playing a thousand capacity room, that person is like maybe putting a Venmo thing or a PayPal donation button on and saying, you know, pay what you can. Um, we realize that what we're doing is just a drop in a bucket. We're trying to help folks who are trying to, who are thinking about their fans and maybe trying to make a little bit of money. 
the there is this is the crazy thing um there is a plot twist here um touring is brutal nobody who has toured for a living actually really likes it that's a little secret um i i don't know go ahead i don't know i mean do you do it for a living 200 shows a year well my husband did and he did retire but there was a time for a time he was pretty happy doing it i get it i understand where you're going but yeah no it, but it is brutal and it, it the, the brutality of it isn't necessarily because look I, i've been on the road too and there's certainly a lot of fun parts of it and if if, they, if there weren't then people wouldn't actually do it but it's when you have have to get up every day you know say you're an emo artist and you've just had twins and, and won the lottery you still have to get up on the stage and be depressed um you know so there's something about it that's unreal and that's part of the brutality of it when you really don't want to go on the road and you have to but anyway in a bizarre way the coronavirus crisis may have a lasting positive impact on the artist's ability to make a living after the virus is found, uh, vaccine is found. So just like the cultural changes brought about by Napster and streaming might have revolutionized the music business, forcing artists to rely on tour revenues, some of what's been addressed already here today, the, the embrace of technology, um, mm -hmm. this is going to, I mean, I, I'm working with artists right now who, uh, this one guy who's an ambassador, he said, you know, I've got this degree from Berkeley and I normally get off the road and then maybe we go in a recording studio or we do something creative and productive that way. But now I've got this degree and I'm putting it to use. I'm learning how to teach music. Yeah. And so, so it sounds like, you know, in historical say in historical cases, I'm going to use a very bad analogy. A lot of people talk about the increased wages that followed the black death. Uh, so uh, perhaps we're seeing an opportunity for new labor, uh, new labor opportunities. I want to be able to uh, thank you, Tom, for that. And I want to, uh, if anyone would like to uh, engage in some uh, questions, cross panelists, uh, feel free. And I've got a question from the audience while you're debating whether you want to ask each other a question. Should we get right to our audience question? Sure. Uh, Christine Bush writes, uh, I would appreciate hearing guests speak to Patreon and Bandcamp as ways for generating income. And we can give a little shout out for Christine's project. Uh, it's at patreon.com slash perchance. Um, so we're going to answer uh, this question. And I think we've sort of started that. Can anyone speak to that to, to start? Florence, are you going to try to monetize besides... Uh, uh, do you, are you using Bandcamp or Patreon? I mean, so music is free now. This is the, the conundrum actually that Tom is referring to the, the change that, cha that made everything uh, different for musicians. People expect music to stream. So, so for example, when we're doing this fundraiser, um, will be relying on people's desire to help uh, at this moment. And uh, will we use Bandcamp? Yeah, probably. I'm not sure what platform we'll use. But um, the problem is that in the world in which Spotify can give you everything, or Napster or iTunes, there's, there's, you have to have a reason to give. And I mean, like I say, I think people will want to give to the Orange County Arts uh, Support Fund um, and they will want to help uh, the cat's cradle survive this. And so they'll say, yes, I'll pay for that song. Um, but certainly I'll be releasing this song on Spotify at the same time. So as a way of, of sustaining artists, not, no, that's not that I don't, I don't see it as being viable. And I agree with Tom that everything is, I mean, it just is dire for musicians and things are gonna be dire for a while. Um, I think though, as you're starting to say, Tom, it is gonna be, it's gonna be, a, I mean, people are not gonna stop making music. 
Um, and so we're just going to have to figure out a different way of making it. I don't think it's band camp. Um, you know, well, jo Jocelyn, I'm curious about, um, you were going to give a talk on Nashville, and we're going to do it again coming up October 24th, fingers crossed, on Cities of Music in Nashville. And one of the things that's interesting is that this does not affect geographical areas equally. I'm thinking about South by Southwest, the billions of dollars of revenue, but I don't know what that brings in for the town. Maybe I just over 420 it, million roughly. There you go. Half a billion. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, the revenue and of course a town like Nashville, uh, which is all about this. So um, this is not distributed equally. And somehow the, the internet is the great equalizer, I suppose, right? In terms of uh, that's where uh, everybody is equally impoverished. But you know, what about towns and localities uh, where these things are happening? I, I, can you speak to that at all, Jocelyn, or anybody jump in? Well, I think as Tom was mentioning, certainly certain cities have um, you know, particular events that have been canceled and they're gonna take a huge direct dollar hit where it's easy to see what that cost was. But I just really liked Florence's overall description of this larger marketplace where musicians have the impulse to play because they love the music and they love their fans. Um, but if, if anybody had figured out how to monetize that effectively right now, we, we wouldn't be having these conversations. Um, I think a lot of us watched the press. I was in Nashville uh, doing a little research for the talk that's now been postponed. Um, right before this happened, I was, I was there until March 9th, literally. Um, and we all probably watched the press as Nashville didn't shut down Lower Broadway as quickly as the state wanted them to. Mm -hmm. uh, some individuals didn't. There was a lot of tension there. Um, and it was the business owners as well as the musicians who were playing in those venues um, that were articulating. I think pretty early on in this situation, what some of my colleagues up here have talked about tonight, which is that tension between both wanting to play and needing to pay the bills um, in these larger situations. Um, I haven't seen it changing based on locale so much as just population density. The cities are dealing with different things because they have the venues and they had the economic support for musicians in a way that um, maybe smaller and more rural areas uh, where I have some family it just it wasn't the same kind of industry before and therefore the impact is not the same i'm curious about we're speaking of a certain uh you know the genre of the touring musician uh those that are doing music that appears in a certain type of venue in the private market you know uh can anyone speak to the big orchestras i know we just looked at the orchestra in france but i mean how about funding public funding i mean we already know that there's been a dearth of this and that this is you know a lot of opera houses and orchestras um symphonies are are really hard pressed already um can anyone speak to that you know sort of the formal world of music i, I can address that briefly in terms of the economic reality most of these orchestras are um, they're established businesses or corporations, even if they're nonprofits. The difference between, I mean, first off, there's some amazing stuff happening in orchestral music online. Um, I think people are relating to classical music in a way that, especially younger kids, in a way that they hadn't before because the aforementioned tuxedos are off. Um, it just seems more casual and approachable, but orchestras, members of orchestras are employees. They're eligible for unemployment. Whatever else happens down the road today, they are at least eligible for unemployment. My concern is if you look at the professional musicians as a pyramid, 75% of the professional music business and not just the musicians, but the stage crews, the promoters, the agents, et cetera, everyone involved in live music, 75% of them make up that bottom part of the pyramid. And in the inverse, 25% of them make 75% of the money. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are mid-level agents at major agencies who are out of job right now, but will be collecting unemployment. There are bassoonists in you know, orchestras who are out of job right now, but will be collecting unemployment. I think the crisis here is in the 75% of the people. They're, they're part of the 23 million people in the gig economy right now who are uncounted in terms mm -hmm. of unemployment. I mean, There's theoretically money out there, but 
Well, gig economy, let's let's not forget. It started with musicians, right? I know that's why yeah. I call them gig economy. <laughs> can I can I have a full confession about gig economy? It was only in the past like four months that I made the connection between like doing a gig. I thought it had something to do with gigabytes. I literally oh I was like, God. so I was like, oh wait, no, I'm I've done gigs. Yeah, I know what a gig is. It's, so Full confession, I'm catching up to the 21st century slowly by the time 2020 comes around. I want to throw one thing in just real quickly, and then we're not going to have time to discuss this, but I think it was Florence who mentioned anxiety. Um, all those people in the live music business right now, this happened within 24 to 48 hours, max. Yes. These are creative people. Even the, even the agents, they're like, generally you scratch an agent, you're going to find a guitar player um, who took a job. They, like, like most academics I know, these are people whose identities are more integrally tied into what they do for work than most people. And the, they happen to also, like myself and probably everyone here, have a healthy egos. There is a mental health crisis like we have never seen before happening right now amongst that community that was already vulnerable by virtue of being artists and vulnerable economically. And again, I am the big downer here, but we have just started to see the beginning of this. Yeah. Thank well, God I think that's, we can that's... make music online as human beings and that we have that outlet because the poop is hitting the fan in that community. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm glad that uh, you can bring up in for particular communities. We will be uh, two weeks from tonight doing a special, uh, sh a special, we're not going to call it a happy hour because it's on mental health in this particular um, It just goes to show there are all sorts of uh, demographics that are decidedly particularly affected and i don't think many people think about that particular uh um, demographic i actually of really appreciate your what you're calling being a downer it's true i mean this is a really big crisis yeah. and it is wonderful um at that 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 and we will keep trying to make music and make it work and link it up to local i mean maybe one thing to say about in addition to all the things that jocelyn clarified for us about like local communities. I mean, maybe that's where rebuilding is going to have to happen. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to know right now, but I think I think you're right to point to how devastating this is and to think about the crews and the people in bands who can't get unemployment because they're self-employed. And you know, I mean, it, it's a big it's a big crisis. Um, so let me ask Mark something here. Mark, um, when I'm thinking about this situation in music and I'm thinking about the, where does music fit in cultures and in societies and the way, and the way society, and you know, we have a very individualistic, capitalistic culture, uh, and this is the way our culture is kind of handling what's going on. Are you finding differences in the way that communities are treating musicians or the way that communities interact with musicians in other cultures uh, that is making this experience a little less isolating for them or just different? Well, I mean, I think um, there are lots of cross-cultural differences, but one thing that I think is, is the same across cultures is that music is a form of, of creating community. And one uh, kind of observation I, I had uh, thinking about this is that right now, not everyone in the world, but many millions of people have the possibility of holding up and listening to music alone for days and days on end without encountering another human being. So in some way, we're well equipped for this pandemic. We could just, I could just close the blinds, put on my headphones and come back in three months after I've listened to, you know, not a single song, you know, repeating. And yet we are drawn to connecting through music. So that's something that I'm seeing that is actually universal, which is the the power of music to build community and to connect people. Um, and we yearn that. Uh, you, we really yearn for it. Uh, and one thing I just want to add about the uh, getting back to something Tom was saying about all the money that's been lost. 
I think we have to start changing the discourse and saying that music is not free. Um, and, um, and that we have to pay people yeah. for what they do. And um, one example, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back a little bit, but um, now that I've gone into um, teaching virtually, I'm bringing all these artists into my classroom. And in the past, uh, people doing a Skype or a Zoom uh, visit, I probably would pay them because they would volunteer. It's just an hour. But I'm now paying them the same that I would pay them if they came in person. And I think we need to think of people's time as extremely valuable and it doesn't really matter whether it's over Zoom or in person. We have mm -hmm. to we have to start paying people, and people like us here have to send that message. And yeah, I know generating projects for which musicians will be paid. That's our project is is aimed towards bringing people in. Hopefully, we'll have Don producing all of these songs. That's a way for Don to continue to make right. So we have to sort of. I agree with that. Right. Right now, and I. I should say, music is free. We expect it to be free, but I think you're right, Mark. I like what you're saying. Yes. Can I have something that's, that's not, not a downer? Can I mention something that's not a downer? Yeah, it, just switch your roles, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, now, of course, this is predicated on these artists already having toured for years and years to develop a major fan base, but a friend of mine, I, uh, uh, you, you, you guys might know the band Disco Biscuits. Um, I did the discovery and development for that band in the late 90s. They were one of my early clients. And the bass player, Mark Brownstein, and a, a friend of his, a promoter who works at AIG, AEG, they started a program called Live Lesson Masters. And Mark reached out to first his sphere of influence and got a lot of other grounded touring artists to jump on board this platform. It's a for-profit platform, but what they've discovered is that each of these individual artists who are part of bands, they have their own fans. You know, Mark has, uh, there's four guys on stage with the Disco Biscuits and a lot of them like Brownie, the bass player, you know, this is also predicated on these fans having disposable income, which a lot of them do. These grounded musicians right now are making more money teaching lessons to super fans with disposable income than they would have been making touring, and they're doing it from their homes. So for a certain select set of artists who did the grind for years, this is a boon in some ways they're home with their families and when the business comes back after we have the vaccine this approach may make it possible for artists to maybe tour a little less or this maybe just brings some uh, an, uh, some additional revenue or hire or at least hire some replacements for you for a couple gigs because you've taught them all your licks right yeah there you go <laughs> something like that <laughs> So listen, and we're coming. We're coming towards the end here. I do want to just acknowledge that we've had a couple of people wanting clarifications. Uh, Christine Bush uh, had mentioned. Um, uh, I'll read this. I would encourage guests to give the public more of a choice to support them online. I use Spotify to discover and share a playlist, but I still buy a lot of music directly from musicians to support them. Please if do. you want them to take uh, if you want to take music seriously, uh, wait. If you want to take seriously that music is free, then release your music on Creative Commons. The other thing is Diana Newton said, I don't understand the insistence that music is considered free. We pay for songs on iTunes, subscription fees for Spotify, tickets to concerts. Please clarify what those statements are based on. Um, so I think there might be just in terms of the terminology. Yeah, let me give you an idea. I wrote a song called Christmas when I was five, not really, but when I was really young in my 20s. And um, it gets played on Continental Airlines. It was recorded by the Posies. And Spotify might make money off of it, but I've gotten checks for four cents for that song. So, and and the consumers pay what? I don't know what Spotify costs, $9 a month? That's essentially free. Whereas it used to be nine or $10 to buy a record. So that revenue is just gone from artists. I wasn't saying, you know, I wasn't, I, I should clarify, I wasn't saying it should be free. You're not promoting the idea of free music. No, I was just, I'm frustrated by the fact yeah. that Spotify and these other platforms make it available at a much, much lower price. And so musicians can no longer make money selling records. 
Yeah, there's tons of money coming through the music industry, but it's not going to the artists. That's why we're in a tickets and t-shirts business for the artists. Yeah. For 75%, for, sorry, for the vast majority of them, 75% of their income, you know, unless you're Beyonce, is coming mm -hmm. through tickets and t-shirts. And I and suppose the in response to um, Christine Bush's uh, point, okay, dinner's ready. Uh, in Christine Bush's point, uh, my drummer husband cooked my dinner, um, uh, about Spotify and, and, you know, not, you know, yes, that's wonderful that you pay your artist for her music, um, it's not a reliable source of income for musicians, sadly, because not everybody's like you, you know? Yeah. And I bet well, you don't pay $10 for the record. Uh, maybe you do, but most people will not. Yeah. It's because of the way that Napster restructured everything, as Tom was referring to. Well, I will say this, folks. This conversation has made me feel liberated a little bit. It always does every Thursday to just take a little time and see uh dear dear friends of mine some friends i've known much longer than others but all good old friends of mine here on on this screen and to see so many names up here that i know are good friends as well um uh, that have joined us for tonight's happy hour uh folks i want to remind you we have a wonderful program go uh, next wednesday on restaurants in this particular uh crisis uh joanna sirk smith will be a uh, uh, host for that one Next week's happy hour is on uh, international. We'll get perspectives from around the world. Hopefully, we'll we'll go to uh, places that are time convenient for us, or we'll figure it out. Um, and then two weeks from now, um, to the point about mental health that uh, Tom had uh, brought up, we will have a whole uh, Think Fast form uh, coordinated with the GAA on mental health, and a lot more programs coming up. If you'd like to get to sleep tonight, folks, you can always go and listen to Max reading uh, Camus plague live on facebook yes indeed i'm doing that so uh one more time let's thank our panelists uh jocelyn neal mark katz florence Thor, and tom baggett uh for carolina public humanities i thank all of you for tuning in and i wish you all a safe and happy evening thank you everybody stay thank safe you so much. Thank love you. everything great, great. Cheers. Thank you so much.